Our next reading from the word of the Lord is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending and alighting upon him like a dove. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The next reading is from the work Arcana Celestia, or Secrets of Heaven, part of number 863. No truth of faith can possibly exist unless it originates in good stemming from love or charity. Just as nothing that truly constitutes the understanding exists unless it comes from the will. Take away the will and no understanding exists, just as was shown many times. Take away charity, therefore, and no faith exists. But because the human will is nothing else than evil desire, the Lord has miraculously taken steps to prevent that which constitutes the understanding part, which is the truth of faith, being immersed in his evil desire and has separated the understanding part of a person's mind from the will part by means of a certain go-between, namely conscience, to which charity is added by the Lord. Without this miraculous provision, no one could ever have been saved. And we read finally a little further on in Arcana Celestia from number 875. This is explaining the inner meaning of the story from Genesis about Noah. The dove found no rest for the sole of its foot means that no good and truth of faith at all had as yet been able to take root. This is clear from the meaning of a dove as the truth of faith and also from the meaning of rest for the sole of the foot as taking root. Amen. The thing that makes spiritual growth hard can be summarized as the need to figure out how to want what we don't want. Sometimes we really do want heavenly things. Sometimes we really do want the Lord to be the most important thing in our lives, to make the neighbor more important than ourselves. We want to give and to share. We want to dwell at peace in the sphere of the Lord's love. Other times, we might know that we should want these things or should at least act like we want them, but we don't. And that's a, it's a familiar problem. And in some ways, it's not such a terrible problem because if we have faith in the Lord, we know that he's promised to change us. He says, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. The miracle of spiritual rebirth is that he transforms our heart. He can make us new so that love that seems impossible now can become who we are. And so we don't have to sit down and figure out how am I going to change what I love and what I feel. We're in charge of how we act. And if we sincerely try to act heavenly, the Lord will make us heavenly. But we still have to want it. Even if 
all that you have to do is try, even if doing it without really loving it is enough, you still have to want it. Somebody who does the right thing because it is the right thing, even when they would really rather have just stayed in bed, wanted to do the right thing. Somebody who, for the sake of their neighbor, keeps a cruel statement to themselves, even though they were burning to say it, wants to be kind, at least with some part of themselves. To be good, we have to want it, and we don't always, at least not with all of ourselves. Maybe there's one part of us that knows and believes and insists that real love and real kindness are worth it no matter what it takes. But then in another part of ourselves, we really do believe that it's just more work than it's worth. And that right where we are, perhaps sitting on the couch by ourselves and eating chips, is where we'll be happiest. In the teachings of the new church, we're told very clearly that our native will, that is what we're born wanting, is corrupt. We're born inclining to natural and selfish things. We're born not really wanting heaven. And one of our readings from Arcana Celeste talked about that. Talked about the human will being nothing else than evil desire. What that passage is really talking about is how the Lord leads us to desire something else. How he leads us to want something that we don't want. I'll read part of it again. Because the human will is nothing else than evil desire, the Lord has miraculously taken steps to prevent that which constitutes the understanding part which is the truth of faith, being immersed in a person's evil desire. And he, the Lord, has separated the understanding part of a person's mind from the will part by means of a certain go-between, namely conscience, to which charity is added by the Lord. Without this miraculous provision, nobody could ever have been saved. And what that passage is saying is that the Lord protects us by enabling us to separate what we think from what we want. So that even if we really want something selfish, we have the power to think, I shouldn't do that. And from that, we have the power to act other than as we feel. And if we make that choice continually, if we choose to do what's right because it's right, regardless of what we want, the Lord grants us a conscience. And the wonderful thing is that we're told he adds charity to that conscience. Charity means kindness, but it's more than just the ability to do acts of kindness. It's a will for kindness. Charity means the spirit of goodwill or the spirit of love for the neighbor. So out of our conscience emerges a will for good. The teachings of the new church use the terms old will and new will. The old will is what we're born with and the new will is what the Lord creates in us if we allow ourselves to be led by conscience. It's that new heart that he gives us in place of the heart of stone. The main message of this sermon is simply the fact that that old will and that new will coexist in us. But before I talk more about that, I want to talk a little bit more about the old will and specifically about the seeming harshness of some of the statements that are made in the teachings of the new church about our old will. 
is it really nothing else than evil desire? Statements like that appear a lot in the doctrine. And it's important to understand that they're describing what we are insofar as we have nothing to do with the Lord. When we're born, we're not just bundles of evil. Nobody who's ever held a baby could possibly say that we were. Babies are filled to brimming over with innocence, and that innocence is the sign of the Lord's presence. It's the gift of his presence. As children grow older, that innocence recedes from them slowly, but there's still a lot of signs that the Lord is present with them. It's only when we, as adults, choose to have nothing to do with the Lord, neither that innocence that we borrowed as children, nor the new will that he offers us, that we're left with only our own will, which is selfish. Even if we understand that the Lord is always with us, giving us his good things to counterbalance our selfish ones, it can be hard to hear that there's something so completely selfish native to every human being. But if we're willing to look honestly at the world, there's a lot of evidence of that. If you've ever seen a small child throw a tantrum, you've seen that we're born with something in us that just doesn't get it when we don't get everything our way. The news is full of a lot of stories of people who do terrible things. Could we sincerely claim that we weren't born with the potential to make those same decisions? There but for the grace of God, Go I. The other really important thing about this old will, or this hereditary evil as it's sometimes called, is that we're not to blame for its existence. It's the condition of the human race, a condition that we've inherited. We're not responsible for the way we're born, but we're responsible for what we do going forward. In the Noah story, the old will is represented by the waters of the flood. The floodwaters covered the earth, drowning out or threatening to drown out everything good. And the dove that Noah sends out represents the beginning of something new. All through the word, doves represent charity and faith. They represent something beautiful that the Lord sends down to us from heaven. Just as the Spirit of God descended like a dove when the Lord Jesus Christ was being baptized. In that story, it says that that Spirit alighted on him, which means that he received it. It rested on him and dwelt with him. And then because he is God, he did what none of us can do. And he made that divine spirit one with himself. In the Noah story, the dove was looking for a place on earth to come to rest. It's a picture of the spirit of charity. The Holy Spirit of the Lord himself searching us to find a home. While the floodwaters covered the earth, there was no place for the dove to rest. The selfishness of the old will is hostile to charity. And just like a bird can't nest under water, charity can't take root in something that doesn't want it. And so for a while, these two things just coexisted. The bird in the sky above and the floodwaters on the earth below. Noah sends the dove out three times. And before he sends the dove out, he sends out a raven, and that raven is there in the background the whole time that the dove is coming and going. 
And as I said in the children's talk, the raven represents falsity, represents untrue ideas that we use to try and understand ourselves and our spiritual lives. And those untrue ideas that we've learned or taken in hover in the background and they resurface now and then. But in the meantime, the Lord gives us the dove. He gives us this truer, more heavenly idea. And our job is to see if we can find a place for it in our lives. See if we can find a place for it to come down to rest. To see if we can take that spirit of charity, that pure and beautiful thing, and give it a home, not just in our minds, but down in real life, down on the ground, as it were. Three times the dove goes out from Noah. The first time that she went out, the story says, Noah sent her out from himself. And when she came back, having found no place to rest, he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. The two mentions of himself. The dove's first mission represents an effort to receive a spirit of charity or an effort to be filled with the heavenly spirit, but an effort to do so from ourselves. We can think of that as trying to create heaven within ourselves, but heaven's not ours to create. When it comes to spiritual things, we're servants and not masters. We can ask the Spirit of God to dwell with us, but if we try to be in charge of it, that doesn't work. When we're trying to be in control, the dove comes back with nothing. The second time Noah sent out the dove, she came back with an olive leaf in her mouth. Olives and olive trees represent love, and a leaf of an olive tree represents faith from that love. We've probably all seen pictures of a dove with an olive branch in its mouth, but the dove in this story only brings back a single leaf. To Noah. Just a tiny little bit of living faith. But it's a sign that something good is beginning to take root in the ground. And the third time Noah sends out the dove, she doesn't come back to him at all. And that, we're told, was the sign that Noah was free. He and every creature with him was free to leave the ark and go out under the sun and begin to live. That departure from the ark represents the victory of the new will, and the whole story is about how we achieve that victory. It's about how the Lord protects us from the flood that rises up from the old will. And it's about how he transforms us and leads us out of the darkness into light. A lot could be said about our responsibilities in this process. We have to learn how to want something we don't want. How to want something new clearly enough and with enough conviction to be willing to fight against the old things that we still want so badly. We have to use our conscience to master the old will which requires willing to do what's right instead of what we want. And a whole lot could be said about all of that, but for now I just want to focus on a simple point. As long as we're still being regenerated, as long as we're still works in progress, the new will and the old will are both us. The dove in the sky is a part of who and what we are, and the floodwaters below are part of who and what we are. And that's why we sometimes want heavenly things so clearly. 
why we're sometimes willing to make sacrifices for our principles and our ideals, why we sometimes feel the living presence of faith in ourselves. And it's also why we sometimes just don't want those things. We don't feel anything spiritual in ourselves, and we don't believe that any of that stuff is worth what it would take to get it. The old will and the new will, the spiritual and the natural are both part of us. And we go in and out of both of them. One hour we're coming from the old will and the next we're coming from the new. This is the way that we human beings work. And yes, we are supposed to be leaving that old will further and further behind as we continue through our lives. And yes, the fact that the old will is a part of us, it doesn't excuse or justify any nasty thing that we choose to do. The hope is that the Lord make us new. The hope is that the Lord take out the stony heart from our flesh and give us a heart of flesh. But in the meantime, it's good to remember that we're works in progress and that what we want is not a single thing. In fact, there's a whole lot of contradictory wants alive inside us at any given time. And that can make life difficult, but it is also a blessing. The fact that we have at once an old will and a new will is what makes it possible for us to want something that we don't want. Recognizing that both of these things are part of us is a powerful place to begin. And then we can pray, as the man in the gospel prayed, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen.